Hey everyone, welcome to Five of Bulls stream tonight on critical elections. Um, so here's where you can find us on social media as far as I think Five of Bull on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Of course, feel free to ask us questions there. Um, if you ever have a topic you'd like us to cover that we're missing out on, um, feel free to post it there as well. We're always open to new ideas and suggestions from all of you. And so this is what we're kind of going to get into today. Um, we're going to talk about first, what is realignment? We're also going to talk about dealignment. Um, they kind of go hand in hand in a sense. And we're going to talk about what causes it. Like, why does it even occur? Why is it a thing? And then we're going to break it down by looking at a bunch of critical elections. Um, so the election of 1800, 1860, 1896, 1932, and then it's going to be the election of like 1964 slash 1968 in a sense. Um, but we're going to cover why those elections are seen as being so critical. And um, my cats, as you can tell, are going to join in in this conversation. That is Frankie. Um, who just wants to kind of like plant himself in front of the screen right now and in front of me to block everything. So let's jump right into this and get into what is realignment and what is uh, what causes it. And we're also going to throw in the word dealignment as well. So realignment, um, the de uh, dictionary definition we're going to go through from Webster's here is changes in underlying electoral forces due to changes in party identification, which basically means that people are changing which political party they support. So people who might used to have been Republican are now Democrat, people who used to be Democrat are now Republican, and there's gotta be a reason why, right? Like people just don't jump ship, things happen. And we're gonna talk about those reasons why. Um, Dealignment would be, um, a trend or a process whereby a large portion of the electorate abandons its previous political party affiliation without developing a new one to replacement um, to replace it. So a lot of times dealignment will be co contrasted with realignment. So realignment is just we're kind of seeing our political parties shift in a sense, right? And what it is they believe. So whereas maybe one party used to be considered conservative, now they're considered liberal and vice versa. Whereas dealignments like I'm just totally not want anything to do with any of these political parties. I'm completely not going to align with any of them. Um, so dealignment, think like when we talk about like independence in our country, right? So that would be a good example of dealignment. You're no longer Republican. You're no longer Democrat. Um, you're not realigning with one of those political parties, in a sense, you're just um, de-aligning from those political parties. Um, you're abandoning your affiliation and you're not developing a new one, um, which is a trend. And we'll kind of get into why that is a trend and what's going on as far as all that is concerned. Um, but anyway, so we have seen throughout history, and again, we're gonna talk about some major elections, but we have seen throughout history that a lot of times party realignments are marked by critical elections. So critical elections are elections that are kind of showing sharp, um, lasting changes in loyalties to political parties. Um, and that's why we're going to look at five critical elections um, within our country's history. Um, and what we're going to see is with each of these elections, we're going to have a realignment that's going to take place, and it's going to lead to the emergence of a different party system. And there's going to be two causes of align realignments that we're going to see when we discuss these elections. One is going to be a party so badly defeated, it kind of fades into obscurity. Meaning there was a political party that existed, they get slammed, that political party is going to die out as a new political party begins to emerge. Um, so that's one reason or one cause of realignments. The second cause of realignments would be if a large block of voters shift their allegiance from one party to another. So in these first couple elections, we're going to talk, we're going to see that either one of those two causes is going to take place. So keep this in mind as we're talking about each election and think to yourself, okay, is this an election where a party's being so badly defeated, it's fading into obscurity as a new party emerges? 
Um, or two, is this an election where a large block of voters have just shifted their allegiance from one party to another? Okay. Hey, Ryder, how are you? Thanks for joining me tonight. Feel free as I go through this um, to ask any questions that you might have. So what we're going to do right now, um, we're going to jump into our very first critical election. And that would be the election of 1800. Who are, well, I was about to say, who are these two gentlemen in the picture? But then I realized, uh, don't be me, put that information on that slide. So, hey, how are you? So we have uh, John Adams here and we have Thomas Jefferson. Hey, Sandra, nice. Good to see a couple of familiar uh, names coming back to join me here tonight. So on the left of this picture will be Thomas Jefferson. On the right of this picture will be John Adams. This is going to be the first of the John Adams because we will have two John Adams as presidents. Um, but this is where we're going to see the first alignment take place, right? So in 1800, we have power shifting from the Federalist Party. So John Adams being a Federalist. Um, and people who tended to follow the Federalists were like Hamilton. Um, they support a strong national government. They want, they support the Bank of the United States, right? And we see that power shifting from the Federalist Party um, to the Jeffersonians. Um, and the Jeffersonians will later be called Democratic Republicans. Just So just know they're kind of one and the same. Um, and those Democratic Republicans favor state rights. They um, favor a limited national government and basically general fewer generally fewer laws. Um, and we're going to see that the Federalists and the Jeffersonians are deeply divided on what is kind of the best course of action for our country. And what will end up happening is federal influ Federalist influence is going to fade in this election of 1800. And we're going to see voters shift to the Democratic Republican Party. Um, and we're going to see for approximately two decades after this election, um, the only party basically in the United States really making a difference or taking a stand, so to speak, is going to be the Democratic Republican Party. Um, so this first election where we have an alignment taking place, um, it's going to be, it's known as the Revolution of 1800 because it's the first peaceful transition of power. Um, John Adams was running for re-election um, during this election. So he was um, a Federalist, and then Thomas Jefferson, obviously, obviously is going to be a Jeffersonian or Democratic Republican. Um, but it's the first time we have a new political party come into office, and we see this peaceful transfer of power, which is huge in our country. Um, in 1824, um, Andrew Jackson, um, my students know I'm not one to normally make political commentary, but Andrew Jackson by far is like, well, probably to me, like one of the presidents. I just cannot stand. But anyway, in 1824, we're going to see that Andrew Jackson will end up founding the Democratic Party, which really emerges out of the Democratic Republican Party. And it continues many of the principles of the Democratic Republican Party. And we're also going to see that same year that the Democratic Party is formed, um, that the National Republican Party is also going to be formed. But just keep in mind, this National Republican Party that's forming in 1824 is not at all connected to the Republican Party that we have today. Um, so just keep that in mind as we're kind of going to be talking about them. Okay, let me, is that a balloon floating in your house or something? Oh, God, where? I don't think so. I mean, I have my cats walking by and then you have my light. This is my cat, but um, no, no, no balloon. Uh, if it was Halloween, it would totally freaked me out, though, because I'm petrified of the movie It and clowns and balloons. Um, but yeah, no, there's there shouldn't be a balloon floating in my house. Hopefully not. If you see it again, let me know, though. Um, so just moving on to our next slide. Oh, actually, before I go into this slide, I just want to talk uh, for one quick second, even though it's not considered a critical election. It's just important to understand that when we do get to the election of 1828, where Jackson will win the presidency in 1828, we're going to see that um, at that point in time, that National Republican Party will now be referred to as the Whig Party. Um, and that's just something I want to mention. It's not considered a critical election. It's just important to understand at this point in time, um, we're seeing our two political parties be the Democrats and then the Whig Party. 
Um, but now we're going to move into what will be um, our second uh, realignment, which is going to be the election of 1860. So the election of 1860, obviously a tense time in our country, right? Um, we have slavery at the forefront in our country, um, and that's making people quite nervous about everything that's going on um, because of the controversial issues of slavery. So what we're going to see happen at this point in time is that the Democrats during the 1850s leading up to this election are really going to break, break into northern and southern wings. So in 1854, we're really going to have the northern Democrats um, who are going to be the abolitionists. Um, some Whigs will be joining that Northern Democratic Party, um, and they're going to nominate um, someone separate from who the Southern Democrats will nominate. Your Southern Democrats are going to be folks who are against abolition, right? They want to keep slavery. And what will end up happening is we see this issue because we see the Democratic Party splintering apart. And with the Democratic Party splintering apart and then each electing two different candidates, one to represent the North and one to represent the South, it's going to make it super, super difficult for them to get enough electoral votes to win an election. Um, so when we have that 1860 election coming up, we're going to see that the Republican Party at this point in time, which is our Republican Party today, um, that Republican Party will end up forming. Um, they are sometimes referred to as the Grand Old Party or the GOP. So if you ever hear them referred to on TV as the GOP, you know why, because it stands for a Grand Old Party. Um, but anyway, uh, this new Republican Party, when they first started, they're actually technically a third party at the time. Um, but then they're going to quickly begin to dominate national politics. And so we're going to see that the Republicans, guys, can we like move, please? We're going to see that the Republicans are going to win this 1860 election. Gosh. And then basically from 1860 to 1932, the Republicans are going to be the one in control of the presidency. Do you think that, okay, good question here. So do you think that Lincoln would have wanted the Democrats to split? That's a really, really good question. I think it would have been super difficult for Lincoln to have won if the Democrats um hadn't split especially so like here too if you look at these cats if you look at this electoral map that's kind of on the side here um you can kind of see where if you were to take that southern democratic vote um and the northern democratic vote um you know it would have led to the northern uh or the democrats possibly getting this one state here um lincoln would have still had the entire north um, I think if you took out the third party Continental Union candidate of Bell, um, that would have been really a toss up at that point in time as to if Lincoln would have won the election or not. I'm not sure it was a split between the Northern and the Southern Democrats. Um, I think it's going to be more um, this Constitutional Union Party. And that's something to keep in mind, too. Whereas third parties in our country don't tend to win elections, Third parties in our country can cause problems as far as taking votes away from one of the major parties in our election. And we've seen that a lot more recently um, in the 90s with Ross Perot um, causing changes to the way people voted. And some people could even make the argument in the last election we had in the 2016 election um, that some of the third party candidates could have possibly taken votes away from Hillary Clinton that could have helped her. Uh, help propel her um, to win that election. But we'll see. So that's a really good question, Dakota. Thank you for asking that. Um, we'll see at this point in time that um, the Grand Old Party, the GOP, the Republicans, um, they're going to dominate politics again from 1816 to 1932. We'll have a couple um, elections in there where Democrats will win. So it's not like they win every single election from this point in time. But for the most part, we're seeing Republican candidates win. And at this point in time, the Republican Party is a party of pro-growth and pro-business. And just keep that in mind because we're going to see things shift, right? And also, the Republican Party is a party of abolition and ending slavery. Um, and so if you look who tends to vote for Republicans during this time, you would see that many minorities are voting for Republicans during this time. Many people from the North are voting for Republicans during this time. 
Whereas the South and the Democrats, right? So the Democrats tend to get their support from the South, and they also get to te- get their tend to get their support from white people. Um, especially whites living in the South. And that's interesting, right? If you think of the Democratic and Republican Party today, and we're going to talk about those elections where we see this completely change, because that's not at all um, our Democratic and Republican Party today um, and where they're getting their votes from and who tends to support them the most. All right, so let's jump into then the election of 1896. This is going to be the election between William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan, um, which is interesting in the sense that if you weren't taking a government course, if you were just taking a straight up American history course, it's probably not an election that would get a lot of focus on. Um, So it's interesting that we do talk about it AP government. But during this, this is going to be the third realignment period. Um, This is the era of big business, right, and expansion. Republicans are still very dominant. Um, It's considered a critical election because we see voters realigning along economic lines. Um, So the economic depressions of the 80s and the 90s um, are panics. You know, a lot of times we saw panics taking place during this time period. Um, They're going to hit the South and the Midwest hard. So we're going to see that the Democratic Party is going to join with uh, third parties such as the Greenbacks and the Populists to try to seek a fair deal for the working class and to represent voters in the South and in the West. Um, Democrats are also going to support a lot of Protestant reformers who are favoring prohibition of alcohol. So for the 1896 presidential election, um, William Jennings Bryan is going to capture the Democratic nomination. Um, The Populist Party is also going to endorse him to run for president. Um, But you're going to have a lot of anti-Bryan Democrats um, so people who are against who identify as Democrats, but who are against William Jennings Bryan, um, who are going to leave the Democratic Party to realign themselves with the Republican Party, um, who has nominated William McKinley to run for president. So the uh, Republicans at this point in time, they're still aligned with big business, industry, capitalist, um, urban interests, in immigrant groups. Um, Democrats feared the anti-liquor stance. Oh, no, sorry. Republicans feared the anti-liquor stance of what was going on with the Democratic Party. Republicans didn't like the idea of prohibition. Um, and they felt as though the Democratic Party was constantly focusing too much on class conflict and workers' rights. Um, so we're going to see that the Republicans are really going to become that party of big business. Um, and they're going to be the ones who are kind of, and which they are when you think about it today, they are still big business today. Um, But this is really going to, during this time period of these economic changes and economic realignments that are taking place, we're really going to see those Republican and Democratic parties um, in the sense that we have today. And what I mean by that is the fact that Republicans tend to be free market, um, whereas the Democrats tend to favor regulation. Was this the first time William Jennings Bryan's Bryan lost? Very good question. William Jennings Bryan um, is kind of like, um, have you all learned about Henry Clay? If you took a push, I don't know if you've taken a push, um, but he's kind of like, hold on a second. He's kind of like um, Henry Clay in the sense that he ran for president quite often. Uh, but yeah, 1896 will be the first time that we will see um, William Jennings Bryan run for um, president. Um, he will run three more times um, for president after that. But really good question. Another great question. Uh, so thank you for asking. Um, but kind of like a Henry Clay. And if you are familiar, Dakota, with Henry Clay, I don't know if you've ever watched Mr. Betts on YouTube. He takes popular songs um, and then makes them to um, American history. And he has, if you know the group Boys to Men, um, and they have a song called It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday. He has a song that it's so hard to say goodbye to Henry Clay. Um, I make my students, I teach AP U.S. history as well, and I make my students watch Mr. Betts all the time. Um, but anyway, it's this 1896 election as far as economic policies of the two political parties um, that we see develop into the two political parties we have today. So there's going to be some other changes that will take place amongst the Democratic and the Republican parties to turn them into the Democratic and Republican parties that we have today. 
But economic wise, it's the election of 1896 that gets them um, to that point. And another just aside about the election of 1896, um, if you've ever read The Wizard of Oz, um, The Wizard of Oz or seen the movie has a lot to do with the politics of what's going on at this time. And there's, I think it's a history teacher or professor who did a whole thing with who William Jennings, William Jennings Bryan would be in The Wizard of Oz and all these different things. Um, so you all should check that out and Google it. <laughs> yeah, Ruth Silver, exactly. Check it out sometime. Um, you got yourself a good teacher, Dakota, that you know all these different things. Um, so the election of 1932, this is when we're going to see our next realignment take place. And think about this, right? This is a big time in American history because we have the Great Depression taking place and moving ever so close uh, to World War II happening. So with the election of 1932, um, in this election, we're going to see FDR running for president. Um, this is going to be considered the fourth realignment to take place. So in the 1930s, we have the Great Depression. We we're going to see at this point in time, America go from being mostly Republican to being solidly Democrat. Um, and that's really going to be thanks to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and what becomes known as his New Deal Coalition. So the New Deal Coalition are the people who at this point in time tend to support Roosevelt, and then in turn, it means they tend to support on the Democratic Party. And this is New Deal coalition will be made up of Democratic state and local party organizations, um, labor unions, blue collar workers, minorities, farmers, um, white Southerners, people living in poverty, immigrants and intellectuals, you know, people like myself. Um, but so you can see this is a very broad group who's supporting the Democratic Party. And the big reason being like, think about, right, the New Deal. This is why it's named the New Deal coalition. The New Deal programs were covering so many different parts of society and so many different um, parts of our country that everyone was benefiting from a sense um, from those New Deal policies. And so that's why we're going to see such a huge coalition of people tend to support one political party. Um, the 1932 presidential election will mark the first time that more Blacks voted Democrat than they did Republican. Um, so again, think about this, right? So from the start of the Republican Party in 1860, we are going to see them tend, we're going to see Black Americans tend to vote um, for the um, Republican Party, right? Because the Republican Party is the party that ended slavery. 1932, that's going to change. And we're going to see that they're now going to start to vote for more Democrats at this point in time. Um, the New Deal coalition sends Roosevelt to the White House four times, right? He's the only president in history to go to the White House four times. It's because of him that the 22nd Amendment will be put in place. So that cannot happen again. Um, and he obviously will lead our country during an economic crisis and through most of World War II. And so we'll see that the Democrats will not only dominate the presidency during this time period, but they're also going to dom dominate Congress, which is going to make it super, super easy. Um, for the Democrats to be able to get a lot of their laws passed. Um, during this time period with the New Deal, we'll see social safety nets are put into place, things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and it makes the government take a really active role in solving social problems. Um, Rammer, uh, the Democrats are the party of regulation, so we're going to see a lot of business regulations take place during this time period. Um, we're going to see the Democrats work to protect unions, which helps to protect uh, workers. Um, we're going to see civil liberties get protected. And we're also going to see during this time period um, more women get voting just due to the fact that women now have the right to vote, which they hadn't had for some time. Um, did the Dust Bowl also happen during his presidency or was that the one before? Loving all of your questions, Dakota. So the Dust Bowl took place, yet yeah, um, he wasn't president when the Dust Bowl took place, um, but he had to deal with the repercussions of the Dust Bowl. Um, the Dust Bowl would be probably um, a few months, maybe, before he became president. Um, but the Dust Bowl was kind of a continuing thing in history because it did last for quite some time 
Um, but again, he mostly had to deal with the economic issues that came from it. But really good question. Um, my cousin just had her baby. We've been waiting since last night for this news. So just give me two seconds. Um, my poor cousin has been in labor forever, it seems like. Anyway, um, so that's the election of 1932. So the election of 1964. Uh, thank you. She, uh, baby girl, I have no name or any other information yet, unfortunately. It sounds like it just happened. Uh, but still, yes, very exciting. Um, so the election of 1964. So it's really the election of 1964 slash 1968 that we're going to see this next realignment take place. And hopefully in the 1960s, you have in your head the whole idea of the civil rights movement is taking place, right? So that's why this is a critical time um, in American history. So in 1960, especially in 1964, um, we're going to see President Lyndon Johnson, right? He's the one who took over for John F. Kennedy um, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Um, he's going to be a Democrat, and he's going to be running for re-election. Um, and what's going to be interesting here with um, Lyndon Johnson in this election is the fact that this is going to be the first time that we're going to see um, the Democrats lose the South, right? So the Democrats, since the Civil War, have had a huge stake, and it was mostly the South who was tending to vote for them. This is going to be the first time he's running against Barry Goldwater, who is the Republican candidate. This is the first time we're going to see that shift. And it's only a few small Southern states here. In 1968, we're going to see it goes across the entire South. Then now the te South tends to vote Republican. Um, and the reason being it's because the Democratic Party really became the party of the civil rights movement. And so Southern white voters are going to leave that New Deal coalition. They're going to be angry that the Democrats are supporting the civil rights movement. And we're going to see that those Southern white voter, voters are going to leave the Democratic Party to go ahead and join the Republican Party. And still today, again, these are generalizations that we're obviously making. But still today, if you look at election maps, in large majority, the South tends to vote Republican more so than Democrat. Doesn't mean we're not going to have outliers in different elections here to there. But for the most part, we are going to see that Southern voters um, are going to tend to vote Dem uh, Republican um, moving forward from this 1964 election on. Um, and it has to do with the civil rights movement. That's why that first change came about. Okay, so then just moving into 1968, um, we've seen this parties or Republican or Democratic parties have continued on the same kind of ideological paths, especially when it comes to economic issues. Um, where we're starting to see now at this point in time in 1968, what we're starting to see now is not changing in our Republican or our Democratic Party, right? So our Democratic Party tends to be liberal at this point in time. Our Republican Party tends to be more conservative. Um, our Democratic Party is much more for social programs. Um, our Republican Party is much for, um, for smaller government, um, big business. Um, you know, the government shouldn't be intervening too much in people's lives. If we think of the major social issues of abortion and health care, the Democratic Party tends to be pro-choice and pro-health care. Um, the Republican Party tends to be pro-life and that health care should really be more of a business model and a private enterprise and not the government supporting it. Um, and that's really all established you know, during this 1960 time frame. But the big thing that's going to happen in 1968, not only do we have the civil rights movement still taking place in 1968, but we also have the Vietnam War taking place. Um, and we're gonna see a growing number of citizens starting in 1968 and continuing through today become independents, right? Meaning they're not gonna align themselves with any political party. They're turning away from politics altogether. And that's where we see a party de-alignment take place, right? So we have Vietnam going on at this point in time, when we move into the 1970s, we're going to have Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal. And the Watergate scandal is going to bring a huge mistrust of government and a mistrust of the political parties in general. Um, not only do we see this party de-alignment taking place in the sense that people don't want to identify with either party, 
but we're also going to start to see our voter turnout drop. Um, and that's going to continue to drop over three decades. Um, if you look at voter turnout percentages in our country, which only actually looks at registered voters and whether or not they're going out to vote, we are one of the lowest countries for people actually going out to vote, registered voters. It's not even taking into account the citizens who could be registered to vote who are not. So I, my, here's my voting uh, spiel. Just when you turn 18, uh, please go out and register to vote. Uh, many people fought for that right for you, and it's very important that you do it. Um, so voting turn, voter turnout's going down during this time period. Party loyalty is decreasing. Um, so what we're going to see is the fact that not only are people leaving their political parties, right, and claiming to be independents, but we're also seeing that people between elections might jump back and forth between voting, right? So in the past, a lot of times when people, and my parents actually still do, do this today, when they go to vote, they just vote straight down the line one political party, right? It doesn't matter if it's um, for president, governor, senator, whatever it is. I don't even think sometimes they even know half the candidates. They're just going straight down the line and voting solely based on political party. We don't tend to see as many people do that anymore. What we tend to see people do is, is like jump, okay? So maybe I'm going to vote. Democrat for president, but then I'm going to vote Republican for governor. And then maybe Democrat for senator, but Republican for House of Representatives. So we're seeing people split their, t it's not splitting the tickets, right? That they're not necessarily all voting the same to a specific party anymore because party loyalty, that whole concept has decreased. Um, and so what ends up resulting because we don't have people tending to vote for just one specific political party in every single government position, we tend to see a divided government, meaning maybe our presidency belongs to one political party, um, but our legislative branch, we're going to see belong to another political party. Or maybe our federal government dominates by one political party, but then our state governments dominate by another political party. And that concept is known as divided government. So we've seen this a lot since 1968. Um, think of it right now, we technically have a divided government, right? Where our president is a Republican, and then our House of Representatives, the majority is Democrat, and then in our Senate, the majority is Republican. So it's divided, it's not all one political party. That has ramifications in the sense that it makes it much harder for both our president and our Congress to get things done, right? It's much easier to get laws and legislation passed if it's the same political party in the legislative branch and in the executive branch. It makes it difficult when you have this concept of a divided government. Um, so that's why, again, when we go back and we look at, we said from the election of 1800 to about the election of 1860, the Democratic Republican Party slash, then it becomes the Democrats when Jackson takes over, um, they dominated politics. 1860 to 1932, we said the Republicans dominated politics. 1932 to about 1968 ish, we see that it's the Democrats who are dominating politics. And now, from 1968 to today's time, we can't say it's one political party or another dominating politics, right? So I was born in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, you had, you know, Ronald Reagan um, twice and then George H.W. Bush, Republicans. But then we saw Clinton take over the 90s. And then after Clinton, we had George W. Bush, right, who was a Republican. Then we went to Barack Obama, who was a Democrat. And now we're at um, Donald Trump, who's a Republican. So what we tend to see more and more is we switch back after one or two elections between political parties. We're not seeing that dominance of 30 years anymore, um, where one political party is really winning almost every single election within a 30 to four year time chunk. And the whole reason we don't see that anymore is because of this concept of dealignment. The fact that one, people are just not associating with either political party or two, People are doing split ticket voting when they do vote. I have some practice questions that we can go over together, um, but I just want to see if there's any. Okay, why did Democrats still hold most of the congressional seats 
in the South until the 90s? Good question, Dakota. So again, the whole idea of this split ticket that we started to see after 1968 shows us that people might tend to vote um, on one level for a specific political party, but then on another level for another one. So the South, when we look at the South, they tend to vote Republican when it comes to the presidency. When it's congressional seats, though, congressional seats are done on a district basis. So because the congressional seats are done on a district basis, that's where you can get those Democrats in to win the election. Um, New Jersey, where I'm from, is another great example of this. Without fail, I think it's the last 60 or 70 years, we have always gone Democrat in our president. Uh, in our vote for president. We always vote Democrat as a majority in our vote for president. But in the last 60 or 70 years, we have actually had more Republican governors, right? It's like one of those odd things that like, how is that possible? But it's just one of those weird things that happens. Um, and a lot of it has to do with where people tend to stand when it comes to social um, issues and where people come to stand when it comes to business issues, right? So some people um, might who think social issues are a responsibility of the state might tend to vote Democrat when it comes to the state. And then if they think that our national government is more for economic issues, they might vote Republican. Um, so it's one of those weird outliers that's really super hard to describe, Dakota. I think a lot of states have it, as you mentioned. Um, you brought up the congressional seats, um, but yeah, it's one. Of, it's definitely one of those odd things that we will continue to see, especially as people still continue to split their ticket. Um, this is going to take place. And then, just I th actually, I think I have one more slide. Yeah. So, just last slide of just political parties today. So, our Democrats, right? We think started with Andrew Jackson. Uh, big states' rights because they had sprung off of the Democratic-Republican Party. Um, so they went from being more power to belong to the states, less power to a central government, to kind of the complete opposite right now, right, where the Democrats are kind of about big government. And big government in the sense of they feel as though government should support people through different social programs, such as Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and health care now is a big part of this. Um, so that's what we mean by big government in the sense that they think government should be more involved and offer more for its citizens. And then you have the Republicans who, right, the abolitionist anti-slavery party in the very beginning when they kicked off, um, which was seen as being very progressive during that time period. So they go from being super progressive anti-slavery party to being uber conservative nowadays, right? So it's just interesting how these political parties have, have kind of um, changed throughout the years, which is completely normal. It'll be interesting. I mean, they have pretty much stayed the same now since 1968, but it would be fascinating to see if there's going to be another critical election of some sort that might change um, the support of these political parties. I think 2016, the 2016 election, and you all can comment on this as well. Um, I think the 2016 election, when we look back in history, um, could possibly become one of those critical elections, but a critical election in the sense where we might see more of a dealignment than we've ever seen. Because I think nowadays there's more people who probably don't want to identify Republican or Democrat. And I think a lot of that comes from that 2016 election. Um, but sometimes we don't know these realignments or these dealignments that they're taking place within the moment. Um, it's not until years later um, that we've kind of seen the impact of those critical elections that we can really say, yeah, a realignment or a dealignment did take place at this time. But um, I'm all, I, I can see the election of 2016 being one of those. And who knows what's going to happen in this upcoming election as well. Um, but let's jump into these practice questions. So, which of the following is most likely to cause a political party um, to change, it should be to change its position on specific issues. I apologize that it says changes. It should say to change its position on a specific issue. Um, a, the challenger to a popular incumbent demands that the party changes its position on the issue. 
Uh, B, polling numbers suggest that the public is undecided about the issue. C, a large group of the party's base supporters advocates for the change of the position. So we have Dakota going with C, Quinn going, everyone's going C. Um, so yes, <laughs> nice, awesome. Yeah, so C is the correct answer. So this could cause a political party to change its position. A large group of the party's base supporters advocate for the change. Um, that could lead to the political party changing. Um, question two, which of the following is the best explanation for why a political party might, again, with these changes, might change its position to begin supporting increased civil rights protections? A, most supporters of the party are advocates for smaller government. B, the party hopes to increase its support among minority groups. C, the party's base has traditionally been highly conservative. Or D, the party gained control of Congress in the last election. All right, all Bs and all correct, yeah. So if a political party is changing its position to begin supporting increased civil rights protections, it's most likely because they're trying to increase their support amongst minority groups. Question three, even though it says two, which of the following most accurately identifies the Democratic Party and Republican Party positions today? So would it be column A? Column B, column C, or column D? Even my cats want to get involved in this conversation. Jumping up here. Yeah, so B is definitely the correct answer. Democrats tend to be pro-choice. Republicans tend to be pro-life. Um, and then if you look at the other options, you know, protect gun rights, that tends to be the Republican position, increase restrictions on gun ownership, that tends to be the Democratic position, um, decrease regulation of bank investments, um, that's Republican, limit the type of investments that can be made by banks, more regulation, that's going to be Democratic, um, imposing pollution restrictions, that's Democratic, and then limiting environmental restrictions, that's Republican. So you just switch all the other ones um, to get to that spot. Um, but those are our Democratic and Republican parties today. I think that's my last question. Let me just check. It is. Are there any questions or anything about political parties today? Um, any of the elections that we covered um, that you want us to delve further into, whatever it might be? Is everyone excited? Can I, are any of you going to be able to vote in the 2020 presidential election by any chance? Yes, awesome, good. I Well, I hope you get it, make sure you get out there and register. I know tomorrow we have voting day here in New Jersey. I'm very excited. Oh no, you got to wait one more election. Uh, that's rough. The 2020, I think it's going to be another good election. Um, I mean, the only thing you can say about the craziness of the 2016 election um, is that you know, whoever you might have supported. Oh, good job, Dakota. Whoever you might have supported, um, I think it got people a little bit more interested in politics. I and mean, maybe we'll see the voter turnout rates go higher than they have been in our country in the past. Um, and then obviously, this is where you can get us on social media, at Think Fiveable, on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, ask questions. If we're not covering, probably, I mean, definitely ask questions, for sure, do that. Um, but if there's a topic you want covered, oh, I see that. Okay. At, suggest topics on those social media sites as well. Could the 90s be a political realignment with the South becoming more strongly Republican, where they gained more seats for the first time since the Civil War with Gingrich? So, yeah, the whole thing with Gingrich and the contract with America um, that he did in the 90s, we do see this change where we do see more of a conservative. Um, group um, become very more prevalent and it is coming from the south but the only thing those um, historians who like kind of you know study this forever and ever they'll say that yeah we might see more numbers at this point in time but they'll still take it back to 1968 um, they'll take it back to we see this change happen because of the civil rights movement um, we see this change happen because of Vietnam. And in the early 70s, we see the moral majority, which um, is during Richard Nixon's um, time as president. 
And that is really all in the South. It's those Southern Christians um, that still dominate the Republican Party today that tend to vote more Republican. Um, so yes, we do see the numbers tick up in the 90s and contract with America and Newt Gingrich has a lot to do with that. But historians will still make the argument that's really taking it all back to 1968 when that got started. Mr. May's class has to watch the next one. Oh, so your teacher makes your class watch like the current events and some of the other ones. That's, that's a good class. That's awesome. Um, but Dakota, I think that was you with the question about the 90s. Does that make a little bit of sense? So the whole, yes, we did see the numbers increase, but they're going to say that it got its start in 1968. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions? You, Dakota, I'm very impressed with your teacher, though, and everything you've brought up tonight. So uh, good job on that one. Um, any other questions, uh, comments, anything I can help you with uh, before we say good night? And again, just encourage you all. Um, Mr. May's class has to watch the current event one, but to encourage you all to watch that. Was McKinley the first big business Republican? Good question. Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, McKinley probably was the first big business Republican. Um, just for the fact that, I mean, some, you, I'm trying to think if you can make, you can probably make the argument about Grant um, as well being a somewhat big business. But I would definitely say that McKinley, for the most part, was the first one. Um, and the reason being really goes to the fact that um, if you think about our first few Republican presidents, um, a lot of our Republican presidents, um, because they did start in 1860, um, a lot of them had to deal with um, the issues that took place after the Civil War happened, right? So a lot of them are more concerned with Reconstruction um, and trying to make civil liberties improve for African Americans, and therefore they couldn't focus as much um, on business. But then when you have McKinley come in, um, you do see that kind of um, take place as far as big business is concerned. Yeah, and Harding, so Harding's just an interesting president um, when you study Harding because you feel like he, his intentions were good, um, but unfortunately some of the people um he got to work for him weren't the best um and so we tended to see a lot of uh um scandals during his presidency unfortunately um but not so much because of him himself um but right the leader always gets blamed in the end buck stops at the leader so to speak but yeah mckinley for sure one of the bigger big president uh big business presidents. And then it's interesting because right after McKinley, if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, it's Teddy Roosevelt who will become president. And Teddy Roosevelt is that mixed bag of, you know, he takes away, you know, he says he's a trust buster, right? But then he talks about how there's good trust and there's bad trust and, you know, getting into all that craziness. Um, any other questions, comments? I'm not in anything of yet. Oh. Nice. This is a good way to get a head start. That's awesome. So my school, um, we do AP Gov slash uh, AP Comparative Politics together as a course. Um, so it's a full year because of that, because we're kind of combining both at the same time um, at a bit of a frantic pace at times. Um, but it's interesting. We focus mostly on the U.S. government in the beginning. Um, but we're starting to move now more into the comparative politics part of the course. Um, and they'll only end up sitting for the comparative politics exam. We don't make them sit for both. But it's very smart to get a jump start here. Texas, you don't take it until 12th. We do. Oh, okay. So I teach in an um, independent school. It's an all-girls school, actually. I only teach um, girls, and they're juniors and seniors. So we don't tend to follow the New Jersey regulations or New Jersey's kind of layout of what year they offer certain courses. So for us, um, if our girls want to take AP World History, they would do it their sophomore year. And then junior year, if they want to take an AP History, they have the choice of AP US. And then senior year, um, they have the choice of AP Government. 
so we don't have too many. That's awesome that you can do economics because we don't, I know a lot of our girls would love to take that, but we don't have that option. We do have an option. We uh, work with one schoolhouse, which is an online independent school. Um, and that would be, you could take co-ed classes through there. So our girls, if we don't offer an AP class, um, do have the option to take it through one schoolhouse um, if they wanted to. But that's cool. Yeah, economics is so very important, uh, as is government in today's day and age for students to be taking. Um, thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed getting to know you all a little bit more, especially since I do tend to see the um, same students here each week. So that's awesome. So please come back next Thursday night um, for campaign finance. Um, and I will see you then. I hope you all have a great week and tune into current events next. Have an awesome night.